Hello and welcome to the Modern Adventurer podcast coming up. I did, a, I did a kite surfing trip with my dad actually down the coast of Peru and it's some of the best waves and best waves in the world break along the coast of Peru and um and they're and they're really long waves. I was out there where there's only two of us, me and my dad, and no one else around, and I dropped my kite and the wave took it and I was leashed onto my kite. And before you knew it, I'm just underwater being dragged by the wave. So the wave power and energy is in the kite. And I'm there underwater being like sort of hogtied and dragged backwards. And it's just going and going and going and going. And I'm like, oh my God, this is going on for a long time. And then I'm trying to reach behind my back for the quick release, but because I'm being dragged too fast, I can't actually get to it. My next guest is an adventurer and kiteboarding extraordinaire. He has some remarkable stories from his times traveling all over the world from Dominican Republic to Sri Lanka to Cuba. We talk on the podcast about some of his incredible experiences over the years. We also talk about his passion for the extreme and how he overcomes fear in doing some of these incredible stunts. And I am delighted to introduce Tom Court to the podcast. John, thanks for having me, mate. Pleasure to be here. Oh, it's absolutely great to have you on. I haven't seen you in quite a few months. It's awesome to sit down and actually have a proper good chat. <laughs> yeah, mate. Yeah, it's been uh, it's great to, to catch up with a fellow adventurist. It's, uh, it's been a strange time for all of us, I think. So it's <laughs> nice to, you know, to be doing these things and to yeah, share experiences at this time. Well, for people listening, Tom is a kite boarder, kite surfer, whatever you want to call it, and has done some incredible stuff over the years. For people listening, let's start at the beginning. How did you actually start down this sort of path? Well, I, yeah, I've always been interested in in travel, and um, I guess for me, I've always used sport as a vehicle for travel, and 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 kite surfing for me came along at a lucky time in my life where I was young enough to to sort of get into it at a good time for the sport and a good time for myself. And, and that opened up for me, like the opportunity to travel with, with kite surfing. Um, I learned to kite surf. My, my dad taught me to kite surf when I was about 11 years old, um, out in the Canary islands. Uh, we were just on a family holiday out there. And, uh, that's sort of where I first, first like learned and really got my hands you know, on on a kite uh, and then since then i never looked back really and uh, and kite surfing's been a part of my life and a part of my career now um since since i can remember so yeah i was very lucky to have that uh, opportunity because you before you sort of did a lot of traveling you were sort of traveling out for competitions and winning winning medals i presume <laughs> yeah well yeah i mean so that's how it started um, my dad taking me around to competitions in the UK and doing the British uh, Championship Series in kite surfing, which realistically at the time was just a really good way to have a nice weekend and a and a fun time and catch up with like minded people doing a similar sport. And then um, I won the British title. I think I won the British Juniors um, in 2002, and then and then I won the top flight. Um, after that and then once once that sort of the ball was rolling in that direction then I uh, started looking to the world tour and did about five or six years traveling around on the world tour and then that sort of you know naturally got me into the into the to the motion of the whole to the whole thing really well you have the sort of uh, privilege of living on the Isle of Wight which is sort of uh, your sort of background playground as one might say you had uh, some pretty awesome sort of content showing over the summer and the summer is sort of taking you all over the place hasn't it yeah well i mean it's been a strange couple of years i guess for everybody um around the country but yeah living on the isle of wight is is definitely a blessing when it comes to you know sports and access to the nature and like you know getting in getting in the water um yeah and that's been a big part of of you know me having access to sport was living on the isle of wight and just you know getting getting out and see as much as i can so yeah it's been a it's been a nice place to live over the years i mean initially with travel and like getting away it, it seemed like a disadvantage because obviously i'd have to get the ferry um off the island every time and then a taxi to the airport so you know what started as a struggle I guess when I was younger, um, or, or an added cost at least, has become very much an advantage. Uh, you know, nowadays that's for sure. 
And so with the sort of, um, with kite surfing, I mean, it's sort of your passion is for this sort of extreme element of the sport. And I mean, we had Megan Hine on yesterday, uh, not yesterday, last time or a few weeks ago, sort of talking about sort of fear. And with kite surfing, you are throwing yourself up many, many meters into the air. How did this sort of progression to sort of conquer that fear or bringing yourself, I don't know, into your sort of element of pushing it sort of one step up every time? Was it a progression or have you always had this sort of drive to push yourself further and further? Yeah, I think that's an, it's a good question. I think in, risk and taking risk is a massive topic. And it's, you know, over, over recent months as well, like, fear and and other things have come into other elements of our life that 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 you can see holding holding you back or or doing things like that where and i think yeah learn like through extreme sport through kite surfing and through taking risk um i think the more you do it the more you become uh you know capable of doing it and the more you you look for it and the more you you realize actually that that a risk isn't necessarily a bad thing and and for me now you know i got to the stage where i really am like searching for risky things and so you know looking for the adrenaline that is associated with pulling something risky off or or pushing yourself to the limits you know physically or mentally um and i think you know sport and kite surfing got me into that from an early age and yeah now at uh, the age of 30 plus uh, it's like become something more uh systematic in my life where i you know i know that i need risk i know that i need to to push myself and i and i feel that you know i, I don't shy away from that um but it's just learn you know it's all about learning to to kind of manage it and and choose your risks wisely and uh and kind of calculate those risks before you take them on but definitely you know taking risk is a big part of of sport um and it's something you know that gives me gives me a lot of kicks and that i that i now look for yeah the sort of drug of adrenaline you're sort of looking for that next yeah yeah i mean it's something you don't get from doing anything other than pushing yourself um to the limit you know to to the limits or close to the limits um and and it's and it's not something you can cultivate really in any in, a, in any other way so in a way it's a very healthy addiction assuming you uh assuming you 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 know you can calculate the the possible risks uh you know well enough <laughs> Amazing. So your, as you said, your trips have taken you all over the world from Sri Lanka to Morocco to all sorts of incredible places. What's the one that sort of sticks out for you as like the adventure paradise? The adventure paradise. I mean, there's many different types of adventure. That's one thing that I've learned over the years, that's for sure. Um, and yeah, I had different phases of my career where I've been traveling for different reasons, like traveling for competition is very different to traveling, you know, for free riding, which I'm doing now, where I'm uh, very much absorbing myself into the location, the place and looking for, you know, different experiences within that rather than staying in one place and, and pushing yourself from a competitive angle. So I feel like, you know, earlier in my career, I got to see a lot less of the places that I was traveling to because I was very focused on, you know, certain specifics, even though it was definitely the reason why I traveled so much was for the sport. But I, I think, you know, the, the recent trip that I've just done um, was felt to me like one of the, the more adventurous trips that I've done in a long time because I was coming off the back of COVID and doing not much um yeah getting out into the sahara desert and just disappearing into into the middle of nowhere with with no one around uh, for me that sort of that sort of exposure and, and separation is something that you can't you know easily get these days so yeah for me something like that is is very uh, exciting <laughs> so you've had a recent one in the dominican of republic what happened there uh, yeah, Dominican Republic, uh, it's, a, it's a paradise in many ways. Uh, it's a great island. I mean, it's next to Haiti. It's on the same island as Haiti. Um, but it's, you know, it's blessed with really good wind conditions and uh, two seasons of the year. So uh, good, good wind and good waves. And uh, it's pretty much 30 degrees most days. So it's, you know, it's a tropical island. 
Um, unfortunately, I left my laptop on the plane on the way out there this time around. So I, I immediately landed on a back foot, uh, <laughs> never found the uh, my MacBook Pro, um, didn't get any response from the airline on that either. So I sort of handicapped myself straight away on that on that trip. Uh, and the rest of the trip was sort of, uh, you know, uh, de- dealing with the repercussions of that. Um, but th- th- those are things that can happen. I think you have to just uh, soak, soak them up as you go along. <laughs> Because kite surfing was quite a sort of new sport in the sort of grand schemes of it. And I suppose it's been growing in popularity over the past sort of 20 years or so. Uh, Is your aim to continue to sort of promote it? Are you doing lots of work to sort of encourage more and more people into kite surfing? Well, yeah, I mean, it goes hand in hand with some of the things I've just said, like the, uh, the ability for a sport to give you access to a lifestyle or you know create the ability for you to take risks or you know get out there and experience things because you're focused on a sport for me that's a very powerful motivation tool that I think a lot of people lack like if you if you imagine going on a trip for sunbathing I mean I can't really even imagine it but like it's there's very little reason for you to get up and go and do it you know and it's very easy to give up on that on that uh that trip uh, for whatever reason that might be whereas if you're going somewhere f- to do a sport to chase the wind to access things that you can't get in the place that you're currently at that that that's where the power of sport really lies for me um, especially nowadays um it used to be motivated by competition and and things like that but yeah i, I mean my my drive within the kite surfing industry is to is to promote it for for the amazing lifestyle possibilities and the amazing uh you know I think impacts it can have on your life. Um, and then, yeah, other than that, I, I like to represent kiteboarding in a visual sense across my YouTube channel um, and, and keep putting out, you know, content that, that really represents kiteboarding for what it is. Um, and I think, you know, now especially is a good time for kite surfing because uh, with the entry to the Olympics in the next, uh, in the next round, it's, it's going to get them a lot more visibility. And I think the industry, the industry has been on a, on a sort of uh, indefinite rise since I started the sport um, at the age of 11. Uh, and now and now it's looking like, you know, something very popular with a lot of uh, very engaging, engaging and interesting people and you're know, taking part in it. So it's, it's quite a, still an exciting time for kite surfing, I think. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people. And as you say, you travel around the world sort of uh, probably with a same sort of group of people who are always competing. What do you think separates like the exceptional ones from the good ones in terms of how do you push yourself to becoming number one in kite surfing? Yeah, well, it's an interesting one. I think to become number one in anything you do in life, you have to have a certain psychology. Um, You have to be very single minded and highly motivated for that end, you know, to become number one. I mean, there is only one number one. But that's not to say there's only one place to be good at something, you know, like there's, there's, you know, having a bigger industry around the sport, I think, makes a big impact and a a lot of space for other people that have talents that aren't necessarily winning. I mean, myself and my career has always been motivated by the lifestyle that the sport can offer rather than, you know, winning the next event. I mean, I always enjoyed that part of it and got kicks and enjoyed the competitive side of it but now it's abundantly clear that that you know you're not always going to be number one you can't always win but there are always opportunities within a growing industry for people to represent different areas or inspire people in different ways and i think you know yeah with the, the content generation and youtube and and different things that are going on there now yeah it's opening doors for possibilities to be good at other things within an industry so yeah i think um yeah, that's that's a really interesting thing for me, I think, about about the development and how things are going. Do you think your psychology has changed over the years from, as you sort of said, from the sort of competing to more like now, more of the enjoyment of the sport? Yes, definitely, definitely. And uh, yeah, a big part of that for me, and I think a big part of any athlete's career is, was injury and, and coming across, you know, injuries that really prevent you from and hold you back from doing the things that you you enjoy doing and then the process of overcoming those injuries 
and you know and and the, pro, the the whole process involved with with coming back from injury uh, that has definitely changed my psychology into into something much more aligned with you know appreciating the moments that the sports can offer rather than just being you know highly motivated in one direction to to achieve the, the pinnacle of achievement um it, yeah it, it gives you a much more rounded uh perspective on i think what what the sport can offer you in general so what happened with this injury well i've blown my acl twice in my right knee and once in my left knee so i've had uh knee knee surgery uh three times um the first knee surgery took um something like 12 months to come back from and then the second one i did it again in competition in the same competition exactly a year later uh doing the same trick it was like a big deja vu and i blew the same acl second time around but the second time around takes a lot longer so it took like 15 months to get back from that so when you you know encompass a three-year span of uh coming up against not being able to do sport and not being able to do things that you enjoy or work or anything like that and my sole realization out of that was i just need to get back to a place where i can enjoy what i love doing um and that was my motivation you know to come back from it all i think if i didn't have the sport i would have found it very difficult to 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 get over the injuries i think i've certainly got an appreciation that the sort of psyche of an injury especially if sport and exercise or anything around that is your life getting injured just absolutely knocks you for six and if it takes away your whole i don't know identity it um it certainly takes a lot to sort of come back from that and you have to sort of completely change your mindset with it i i certainly felt that when you get injured like you have some really dark days and you have to sort of find the route at the end of the tunnel which is for you kite surfing and as you say you went from that competing to now sort of more of the enjoyment sense definitely definitely i mean i so i, I mentioned i did it twice on on one knee and I, what the, the profound realization that I had one when I felt this, felt it happen the second time was that I had not actually really learned anything from the first time it happened. So, and, and, and the first time round, the recovery process for me was very much um, to getting back to where I was prior to the injury. So, you know, becoming the person that I had been and getting back to competition and getting back into competing and getting better again than I was previously. And I just realized actually on the second time round, you have to become a new person. You have to become somebody who you will be, you know, not who you were. And injury is a very, uh, I mean, it's the, you know, most educational process that I think anyone can go through. And I think, yeah, having, having a focus, having a drive and having a sport and something that you know that you love is key to getting through it, to getting through it um and and also the knowledge that you will be somebody new after it rather than the person you were before is is a is a vital piece of the puzzle i think to to getting through it yeah it's that sort of process of who you are to who you're about to become i think i think it's definitely important and for anyone who's had long long term injuries i think would understand but that's what four years with three acls that's four years of your career on the sidelines yeah pretty much yeah pretty much and uh, you know this is where i i i kind of knew initially you know every athlete is aware of the injury risk um and i kind of knew that the that, that the knees were a, a weak point in kite surfing and I, I was expecting it in some in many ways but it doesn't help you when it finally happens but i'd been filming and building content libraries and you know really kind of almost without realizing it investing time in in things that i could do when i was injured so you know within that time i released a movie sort of like a called the free ride project uh on youtube it's uh, there's four of them now i've done four movies um you know it's like a 45 minute sort of edit about you know the kite surfing industry and getting behind the scenes and like how boards are made and you know the the life of the riders and 
kind of absorbing myself into the industry and in other ways um, and and kind of being entrepreneurial in a sense of how do I stay in this industry? How do I add value to this industry? And how can I, you know, retain my, you know, position within within it um, o- over the recovery period? And I was lucky enough to have sponsors that really, you know, stuck with me through that and uh, and supported my vision. So it, it was, uh, you know, in the end became has become a very positive um, process in my life. And I think, you know, it could at one point it could have easily gone the other way um, very easily. I think, you know, when it comes to finding out who you want to become through injury, I think it's an amazing sort of transition and one that, you know, as you as you say, for me, for you, it was trying to stay in the game. For me, it was trying to sort of stay in the game. And, you know, it's why one of the main reasons why I set up the podcast and through it, you actually discover so much more because I think maybe like you, I was very focused down one path and injury sort of makes you s- step back and sort of look at the bigger picture. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It like opens. I mean, if if you don't take the time to open up and to look at, you know, the bigger picture and you, you focus on the minutiae of your injury, you, you don't, yeah, you don't get the perspective. And I think that's a big part of, a big part of the recovery process or a successful recovery process rather, you know, is to really do that and to kind of expand your mind around the topic and absorb in the process of recovery and, and let that journey become the journey, you know, like that's, it's a very, uh, it's an important part of it um, to, to kind of let yourself go into, into the, don't fight the process, you know, like like, let, let it in somehow. And, uh, and really, you can make it almost anything positive for yourself um, over time. So, yeah, it's what it's kind of what I came away from it with. Yeah, and I'm still still kite surfing. And I was told many times I would never walk or never do sport again by you know by a lot of doctors. And you just think, you know, mate, you don't know me, so uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna get back to it. God, that's incredible. And um, as you say, you you um, you've sort of been traveling over the world pre-covid let's say um quite a bit sort of from place to place cuba was one of your many interesting trips what were you doing over there yeah so i uh, cuba was a, quite a while ago now but um yeah the, there's a few videos on my youtube channel about that but I, I went to cuba when they opened up the the tourism to america um, and as, as part of my role, uh, you know, within the brands that I ride for and, you know, within the kiteboarding industry, I've done quite a bit of like location exploration in terms of kiteboarding development, where's good for kiteboarding, you know, how how countries or tourism boards would use sport and kite surfing to, you know, encourage tourism in their areas. And that was, you know, a big part of my role there going to Cuba was to represent kite surfing as a sport in a way and uh you know paint the picture as how you can develop tourism around sports and around an active lifestyle that really can benefit you know the area and the country and it can be a very positive way to get tourism in your in into your area you know because you've got people coming for interest revolving around nature they're all very they're very aware of their surroundings they're not the tourists that are going to like destroy the environment or you know they're there to appreciate what's going on and they're also there to spend money on what they love doing so it's not a begrudging uh, you know relationship with with tourism in that in that respect so there's a lot of positive angles to to sports development and yeah i think you know many trips i've done in the past including sri lanka actually I, i went to sri lanka in 2005 and when I first went there, there was hardly anyone kite surfing, like, and, uh, you know, not much going on, no tourism. And we found this lagoon in the north of Sri Lanka called uh, Kalpicha. And uh, I mean, there were a few people kiting there and maybe a few kite schools just setting up, but like, you know, maybe three or four people on the water at a time in a village with nothing but fishermen. And then now, you know, skip forward, like almost, yeah, well, nearly you know, 15, 20 years later, it's one of the most well-known kite spots in the world. It's got like high-end kite surfing setups there and, you know, 
safaris that go off down the coast on boats and it's got a bustling productive you know, western tourism industry that is symbiont with the local village and the local town and you know it's, you've just got you know people coming in for the interest of it and you've got people you know villages like hundreds of people thousands of people living off that source of income so it's it's i've seen the very very positive side of what kite surfing can be for for countries and people yeah i think when um when it sort of comes to it you know kite surfing has this sort of incredible lure you know even got me back here you know when i was trying to learn how to kite surf <laughs> won't go into detail of the, that experience but um no it's got this incredible lure where these places can easily sort of set up and it's just the most incredible I don't know sort of picturesque view to sort of as you say just shoot up and down the coast on yeah I mean it's uh it's just a, an insane sport for exploration now even around here in the UK so much uh so many good spots for it and so many good opportunities to to learn i mean yeah it's it's a great place to a great way to experience like like everything in you know coastal direction i guess so i have to say over the years we've seen a few sort of um probably viral kite surfing videos have you ever uh tried to kite surf a hurricane oh yeah 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 i've kite surfed big storms before yeah <laughs> kite surfed uh yeah, 100 mile an hour winds down here on the Isle of Wight. Definitely kite surfed a few hurricanes in the Caribbean. Um, as I haven't filmed them, but I've just been out for fun, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, what is it up in Necker Island? I know Richard Branson is always very, very keen on his kite surfing, where they sort of just lob you off uh, a sort of rock on the side and they just sort of drift round and round and round slowly to for about sort of, 30 seconds just sort of what's it paragliding almost with the kite <laughs> yeah that's a friend of mine a friend of mine nick jacobson jumped off the top of necker island um I, that's definitely not one that they're going to do to the average guest i don't think <laughs> but i've been out to necker and 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 sort of kite surf with richard a few times and and yeah i mean the kite the one amazing thing about the kite surfing industry is it's very close knit um and there's a lot of really interesting people that do kite surf and if you you know if you're really ingrained in the sport there's probably not many places you haven't been with it you know so it's uh, yeah there's a lot of people that love kite surfing out there um and a lot of amazing things to be done with a kite that's for sure are you planning to push yourself for a new new one I'm always pushing myself, definitely. Um, one way or another, I think that's something I realize, you know, over time you need you need goals, you need to push yourself, you need definitely need motion. So uh, I'm always looking for fun videos to make and uh, fun stunts to do. I've got, got my eye on a few of the cliffs down here on the Isle of Wight that haven't been done before. So we'll see, watch this space. Oh, well, we'll have to uh, follow your little Instagram closely then. <laughs> I'd say it hasn't been that long since I've got over injury, so I'm not jumping off any cliffs just yet. But I, once I feel the itch again, you know. Yeah, it'll suddenly be like, oh, injury. No, I, I've forgotten all about that. <laughs> <laughs> suddenly see it like, I can do it. I can do it. <laughs> and I suppose, you know, ha apart from your injuries, have there been many close scares on these sort of trips? Because, you know, Right, you you do hear sort of big waves getting caught out with the kite. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Wave trips. I mean, waves are always dangerous. I mean, the ocean's always dangerous. Every time you do something stupid in the sea, you've got to be, you know, you got to have your eyes open. You know, like she's a she's a cruel mistress. Um, but um, yeah, we I did a when I nearly drowned in Peru. Um, we did a I did a kite surfing trip with my dad actually down the coast of Peru, and some of the best waves and best waves in the world break along the coast of Peru, and um, and they're and they're really long waves. And um, I was out there. It was only two of us, me and my dad, and no one else around. And I dropped my kite, and the wave took it, and I was leashed onto my kite. And before you knew it, I'm just underwater being dragged by the wave. So the wave power and energy is in the kite. And I'm there underwater being like sort of hogtied and dragged backwards. And it's just going and going and going and going. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is 
it's going on for a long time and then I'm trying to reach behind my back for the quick release but because I'm being dragged too fast I can't actually get to it so I was luckily enough I, you know the, the wave kind of let the kite go and I managed to get up and get a breath before uh, before really uh, anything too bad happened but yeah bef- you know things can happen very quickly um, very quickly um, you just have to be kind of aware and ready ready for it you know <laughs> Well, it's an amazing sport and I suppose anyone sort of listening and still very keen, what's the sort of one thing you would recommend for people wanting to get started in kite surfing? Yeah, so one, well, I mean, getting started in kite surfing is one of the most fun things. I, I think like what, you've got to bear in mind that your first contact with the sport will be, you know, a little overwhelming. There's a lot going on. You've got a kite, you've got a board, you know, there's a lot to like kind of seemingly process with it. So the best thing you can do is is go to a school, find a local, you know, coach or or teacher, and and really get some time um, where the education process at the very beginning is is ingrained in you. You know, like how to rig up your kite, how to, you know, really be safe for yourself because that, that will stand you in great stead further down the line when it comes to being independent and like you know being able to assess the weather correctly and the wind and like there's a lot of elements in it that, that you actually probably wouldn't consider but that's that's definitely the, the way to get into it is is go to go to a, a school or or a, or a coach and, and get them to you know invest some time in you to to kind of get that first contact point oh nice oh, nice uh, and they'll also have their own gear as well and you can trash that rather than trashing your own so i would yeah 100 percent recommend trashing someone else's gear first before you invest you know yeah no that's always best go and learn and then get your own yeah yeah and and there's you know safety elements and community guidelines and things that you need to like you know learn is like when i learned it was wild wild west you know like you just go down the beach rig up and send it and there was no one around there was no like you know there was nothing there weren't even kite schools so now the gear is so much easier um so much safer you know you've got a system in place and schools there to, to really like teach you so the the learning process can be any anywhere between like a week or like even a couple of days if you really like just get into it you know yeah well, Tom, this has been absolutely awesome to uh, hear about. Uh, there's a part of the show where we ask five questions to each guest each week. Uh, with the first being, what's the one gadget uh, that you always take with you? Whew, it used to be, it used to be, uh, my, well, okay, so definitely a camera, uh, definitely a camera, but then uh, it's probably an iPhone these days. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, probably the iPhone is the, is the gadget that I would take with me now. Having just come back from the Western Sahara, with nothing but my iPhone, I can tell you it's probably a, a good, a good, good one gadget to have. A little, a little, a little lifesaver. lifesaver. <laughs> yeah, it's a lifesaver. Yeah, but I, a camera, a laptop, and a phone, and that's it. That's all you need in life, really. Yeah. What about your favorite adventure book or travel book? My favorite adventure book is probably just my diary. <laughs> I reckon. Just take the diary, write it down. <laughs> <laughs> the diary is a Tom Court. <laughs> the diaries of Tom Cotton, I'm working on it. Yeah, there's unbelievable ones in there. You'll have your memoirs in like when you're 70 of this sort of vast encyclopedia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm ho- yeah, it's true. You don't only really get into the really interesting stories once you get a bit older. I thought I used to have a lot to write about, but I've definitely got more now, that's for sure. <laughs> um, why are these sort of adventures important to you? So, I mean, they're, they're really important to me. I mean, getting yourself out of your comfort zone, pushing for me personally getting yeah getting myself out of my comfort zone and and looking to expand my knowledge you know whether that's meeting different people seeing different places a, a large part of my education in life i feel has been through travel through experience through you know meeting people and and through through sport so like for me i find it it's a it's a personal development thing for me as much as as much as the enjoyment of life at the time it's it's about you know really developing yourself and 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 not letting yourself get too comfortable uh, i think that's a big thing you know like getting too comfortable for me is 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 a problem you know and uh, and i think that's that's really important to to realize yeah i think someone that was uh, saying yesterday yesterday or this morning i can't even remember 
it was basically saying that the best things in life always come from uncomfortable uncomfortable situation no one ever sort of goes oh my god the best time happened when we were super comfortable just relaxing <laughs> yeah yeah well, it's like, it's sort like pushing, yeah. Yourself pushing yourself to achieve a goal or to drive somewhere not yeah not. and i think hardship hardship whichever way you look at it like hardship flowers some of the best art some of the best inspiration some of the best you know feats of human endeavor come from hardship so i think you know not being afraid of putting yourself in a situation that is uncomfortable is is a big thing and uh every, you know when i you know having sat at home on the sofa for, for a long period of time for the longest period of time i've ever done i now know really the value of of getting back to uh yeah pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone i think it's, it's so so valuable for for me and and for it can be valuable for a lot of people very nice. Uh, what about your favorite quote? My favorite quote? Oh, he put me on the spot here. I don't know. Um, there's a lot of quotes about, isn't there? I think one that's cropped up recently was uh, life's not about learning to weather the storm. It's about learning to dance in the rain. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I like that one. Yeah. That one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the storm might not ever pass. That's the issue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and man, I, that somebody just randomly Instagrammed me that uh, not so long ago, and it just—I mean, it's—it's it's right, right? I mean, the storm doesn't doesn't pass. Yeah, the yeah. life is life is the storm. I think is the uh, is the thing that you need to come to terms with. Yeah, uh, people listening are always keen to travel and go on these sort of grand adventures around the world, like yourself. What would you recommend for people wanting to get started? I, I would say, I mean, so I, I host uh, a series of, of travel trips uh, personally, and I know that there's a lot of people that do this sort of thing um, so that, that are sort of adventure based uh, but with a coaching element. Um, like if, if, you, if you're not comfortable traveling on your own or, you know, or you feel like there's a, you know, you want to get started with it, uh, I would say something like that is a great way to start, you know book, book a, a trip with somebody that does it a lot um, and get some experience, learn from people that do it a lot and see how people's psychologies are. And also once you get the ball rolling with these things, you meet people, you know, you meet people that are also doing it. And before you know it, you've got friends that are traveling and then you've got connections and you've also then got focus of where to go next because somebody else is going there or, or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, without self-promoting too much, check out my slice of life camps and stuff. But yeah, like look look for something like that. And um, finally, what are you doing now and how can people follow you in the future? So at the moment, I'm back in the UK for, for the next month or so. I'm doing a, a display at the Southampton Boat Show um, with Flightboard, which are these new electric foil boards. Um, that will be for the most of September. And there's also a kite surfing event down here in the UK called the Kite Surfing Armada, which I'll be at for a weekend. Um, but yeah, follow me on Instagram at Court in the Act. And uh, yeah, subscribe to my YouTube channel as well. Just Tom Court, um, Tom Court Kite on YouTube. And uh, you, you'll uh, you'll be able to follow along on uh, my various activities and missions. We I uh, did see you uh, in the press the other day uh, on that little flyboard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I did... Uh, there's another mission that came off the top of my head. I wanted to see if I could um, commute from the Isle of Wight to Sandbanks, pool Sandbanks, for lunch on a on an electric foil board on a flight board, um, and yeah, I managed to pull it off. Like in between a few trips, we uh, yeah just did thirty miles over over water in a suit on an electric foil board, and uh, and got to lunch on time. So yeah, that was pretty. <laughs> pretty sick actually did that suit manage to weather the storm <laughs> yeah yeah the suit's still there yeah it got wet at the end it got wet at the end you have to watch the video but it, got, <laughs> it did get wet but yeah no it's really cool and it was on the hottest one of the hottest days of the year that we had so far and yeah it sort of went all over the press really it went to the times and the telegraph and yeah all yeah. over but i think you know just encouraging people to do, do things differently and there's there's quite a good uh you know innovation element there with yeah eco water use and, and different ways to enjoy yourself so yeah it's an interesting one yeah they're pretty cool little boards i have to say 
yeah they're awesome bits of kits like backcountry snowboarding on flat water yeah, it's really good. <laughs> just grab just it grab it and fr- off, off you go off you go <laughs> yeah just pull the trigger and just send it and finally i'm sure everyone is wondering what's what's next for tom court it's a difficult one eh? uh, at the moment i haven't got anything in the diary i've got no- i've got a free so that's the most worrying thing for me generally is having nothing in the diary i mean i've got september is planned it's all around here in the uk um but then after that i have nothing nothing solid but it might be back to dominican republic maybe even brazil for the winter season um and then uh maybe some time in the canary islands um before coming back to the uk at the beginning of summer next year very nice very nice well it could be worse could be worse i mean let's see (laughs) you don't know what's possible at the moment who knows who knows (laughs) who knows well tom it's been an absolute pleasure listening to your stories and about your life it's been an interesting one eh? it's always (laughs) interesting to talk about about these things um they, they they stay very much under the surface unless uh unless i'm asked <laughs> i'm sure i'm sure there's a few more stories to come in the future as well yeah mate we could sit here for hours <laughs> <laughs> well again thank you so much no worries thank you thanks for the time and uh, thanks for having me well that is it for today thank you so much for listening and i hope you got something out of it if you did hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already and i will see you in the next show